Parshas Truma, the topic of our Dvar Torah today, is called Envisioning a Brighter Future. We know that the Jewish people in Parshas Truma are told to construct the tabernacle, to instruct, construct the Mishka, this beautiful, portable edifice in which they're supposed to worship Hashem through a sacrificial service, and where the Jewish nation is supposed to coalesce when they perceive that the Divine Presence descends in between the two Keruvim, and they feel that the, the, the divinity is in their midst. There's a famous question that a number of commentaries ask, which is, you have a, an entire population, an entire nation traveling in the midst of a barren <coughs> desert. Where did they get the materials with which to construct the Mishka? Where did they get all of the gold, the silver, the uh, the atzei the shitim, the shitim or acacia wood? Where did they get all of these provisions in order to be able to build it? The simplest answer to this question is from uh, is provided to us by the Abarbanel. The Abarbanel asks this question, and in source number one, he first quotes from the Ibn Ezra who says as follows, he says, V'harav ibn Ezra kosav, she'ya'ar haya samuch lahar Sinai. <coughs> ibn Ezra says that there was a forest not far from Mount Sinai, u'moshe karsu osam lechatsrehem v'lischorosehem v'hisnadvu kol mishanim tzaito haru'uyim lakiroshim. And that Moshe chopped down many of these trees for their courtyards, lechatsrehem, for their courtyards, it seems, the lischorosehem, and for their merchandise, and the hisnadvu komishin imtsaito haruuyim lakarashim. And I guess people donated other commodities that could be used in concert with these beams, or to be made into these beams. So Ibn Ezra says that there were natural resources available near Har Sinai from which they got at least the wood, and they used it, and I guess they manufactured the wood into beams. But the Abarbanel says, I'm not so happy with this explanation, because it does seem a little bit far-fetched. You would need a wood mill in order to be able to turn uh, tr trees into lumber. So therefore he says, V'hayosem nachon hu, he says what really is probably the most logical is that there were other neighboring nations like Bedouins and other peoples who lived uh, nearby the desert where the Jews were traveling. And they would come because they heard that there was an entire nation of people, millions of people who were traveling in the desert. And they came to Machane Yisrael. They came to, these were uh, traveling peddlers that came regularly to the Jewish camp, Linkor Kolmine Schoros, to sell all different kinds of merchandise. Umisham Kanu Hashemen Lamoor, Vahabisamim, Vishemen Lamishcha, Veliktores. And it's from there that the Jews purchased the oil for the menorah and all of the spices and the oil for anointing and for the ketores. That's where they got all of these things from. He says it does, it's, it's illogical to assume that they took all of these things with them out of Egypt, the oils and the, uh, and the spices and the, and the incense and all of these other things. And if, they, if these peddlers, these itinerant peddlers, we're selling them all of these other commodities. It stands to reason that you could put your order in with, you know, Ahmed the uh, the peddler, and tell him that you needed uh, you needed some beams, you needed some lumber, and that's how the Jews got all of the materials. They got it from Ahmed and and uh, and um, Jamal and all of the other guys that were that were in the desert. Uh, we're selling them all of these things. But Rashi tells us something different. Rashi tells us in two different places in this Parsha, he talks about the Atsei Shitim, the Shittite wood that was used as one of the raw materials of the Mishkan. First, where the Torah says you shall take Atsei Shitim, this type of lumber, Rashi says, Me'ayin hayu lahem bamidbar. Where did they get this from? Piresh Rebbe Tanchuma. 
Rabbi Tanchuma, which is the, who is the author of the Medrash Tanchuma, tells us that Yaakov Avinu Tzafa Beruach HaKodesh, that Yaakov Avinu, already when he, the first generation of Jews who comes down to Egypt, he already saw prophetically, Sha'asid in Yisrael Livnos Mishkan Bamidbar, that the Jews would eventually build a Mishkan in the desert. Vehevi Arazim Lemitzrayim Uneta'am. He brought cedars, which I guess is comparable to the Atzei Shittim that the Torah is talking about. He took little saplings from Israel, from Eretz Yisrael, brings them with him and plants them in Egypt. And he told his children before he died, boys, you see those trees growing in the backyard? Eventually you're going to be leaving this place and you're going to be going back to Eretz Yisrael. When it comes time for you to leave, take all the provisions you need to build a Mishkan, including chop down those cedar trees growing in the backyard and schlep them out with you. That's what Yaakov had the foresight to be able to tell his children. Now Rashi tells this to us a second time, a chapter later, also in Parshas Truma. And one of the questions that we're gonna to have to ask ourselves is, what is Rashi communicating to us in the second Rashi? that he hasn't already communicated to us in the first Rashi. Let's take a look at the second Rashi, where the Torah says, Ve'asisa es ha'kerashi. You shall make the beams, which are going to act as the wooden uh, uh, frame, the wooden walls, when you put them all together, the wooden walls of the Mishka. Hayalolomar ve'asisa kerashim, kemashen emar bechol davar bedavar. Umahu ha'kerashim. The question is, why does it say hakirash in the beams with the definite article? The answer is, is that they had already been designated. These beams were not just any old beams, they had already been de designated as the beams from the times of Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov Avinu Tzafa Beruach HaKodesh Venata Arazim Bimitzrayim. That Yaakov had the foresight in Egypt already and knew that there was going to be a Mishkan and he planted cedars in Egypt. And when he died, he told his children, take those trees with you when you leave Egypt. He told them, He said, God is eventually going to command you to make a mishka in the desert from, these, from Shittite wood. And I want you to make sure that you will be prepared and you will have this lumber with you. And Rashi just finishes off by saying that there's a famous liturgical poem that he is aware of that I, that I don't think we say anymore, which is that uh, the Jewish people with alacrity were sure to bring this wood with them in order to build the Mishka. Um, so the first question is... Um, you know, why is it necessary for us to conclude that the Jewish people did this, that Yaakov Avinu did this? In other words, what is the... Why did Chazal feel that it is so important to make a point of telling us that this is what Yaakov Avinu foresaw with Ruach HaKodesh, and that's how the Jewish people got the materials? Another question is, why is it specifically that the Medrash focuses on the wood? And finally, why does, the, why does Rashi feel that it's necessary to point this out twice? What is he adding in the second Rashi that he hasn't already told us in the first Rashi? So those are things that I'd like you to think about when we read a small passage from a much larger essay from the Lubavitcher Rebbe of Blessed Memory, which I, which I have here in the bottom for you, which will help us at least answer a portion of the question. The Rebbe says in one of his famous Likuta Sichos, he says as follows, He says, you notice that in the first Rashi, Rashi started off by saying, Piresh Rabbi Tanchuma, that Rabbi Tanchuma said, now Rashi doesn't normally say that. He usually says, Isa B'Tanchuma, or Isa B'Medrish, or Isa B'Chazal, Rashi just quotes a Medrash. Why does he have to say that Rabbi Tanchuma said this? 
He wanted to tell us Tanchuma humiloshon Tanchumin. The word Tanchuma comes from the word consolation or Nechama. V'lachain pirish Rabbi Tanchuma sheYakov Avinu tzafa beruach Hakodesh b'chulo mikiven sheinyan zehu nechamatan shel Yisrael. He wanted Yaakov wanted to console his children before he died. He wanted to let them know, Kinderlach, you're not going to be here forever. There will come a time when you will not have to wake up in the morning and see the Egyptian landscape. There will come a time when you're not going to be slaves. There will come a time when you'll be able to go back to your own homeland. Kasher b'nei Yisrael nimtzim begolus mitzrayim mitbimatzav dekoshi hashibud va'ad l'gzerat kol ha'bein ha'yilod ha'yoore tashlichu. He says, Yaakov knew that his children were in Golos, and he knew that they would be enslaved, and he knew that they, their children were going to be thrown into the Nile. Yaakov Avinu also wanted his children to wake up every morning and see the inherent consolation of waking up and looking at in the Jewish neighborhood and seeing those trees that our Tata Yaakov, our Zayda Yaakov Avinu, brought with him from Eretz Yisrael and planted here in Egypt. He wanted them to have that consolation during the very, very difficult and dark years of Golis. And as Rashi says, Yaakov knew that his children would build a Mishkan in the desert. And he told his children, take them with you when you leave Egypt. That is to say, Of course they could have gotten the lumber in some other way. There's no question, like the Abarbanel says, that if you're traveling in the desert, you can always find a Bedouin to help you get whatever materials you need. But in order for the Jewish people to experience consolation while still in Egypt, that's why Yaakov took those cedars and planted them in Egypt. He wanted them to have in front of their eyes these trees that were planted so that when they would leave, they would leave with them. He says, that's why Yaakov Avinu did it. He wanted there to be a constant reminder that there will come a day when you will be redeemed. And I schlepped these trees down, my children, so that you would know that you're going to need them one day. Don't forget to take them with you. And with this, and you can continue the, the, the little snippet yourselves, I think we can also understand why both Rashis are necessary. You see, the first Rashi is telling us why Yaakov Avinu took down the wood with the trees with him from Eretz Yisrael to Egypt. The first Rashi is trying to impress upon, uh, upon the Jews in Egypt exactly what the Lubavitcher Rebbe said, and that is that you need to know that there will come a time when your redemption will approach and you will not be here forever. Whenever you see the trees, you'll remember that. But there's something else that's very important, and that has to do with the Asisa es HaKerashim Atzei Shitim Omdim. The Torah says, you know what Kerashim are? You know what these beams are? They're standing, vertically standing, pieces of Atzei Shitim lumber. And the, there's a totally different message here. Rashi goes to the extent to point out to us in another Rashi that the beams cannot be standing horizontally like when you make a log cabin. It's very important for the beams to be standing vertically next to each other. Atzei shitim omdim means that when you, the Jewish people, leave Egypt, you're not just going to leave. You're not going to leave as broken people. You're going to be leaving, va'olech eschem, as the Torah says, komemius, you'll be taken out of Egypt, standing tall and proud and erect without any defect within you. You'll be like those standing beams of the Krashim. Not only am I telling you, am I giving you the message that you're going to leave Egypt, but I'm telling you even a secondary message, and that's why you need the second Rashi, that you're going to be leaving standing as atzei shitim omdim, beams of wood that are beaming, literally, 
and that you're going to be beaming, standing tall and proud when you leave. And that's, when you think about it, and you think about your, uh, God forbid, your, 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 your parents or grandparents are in the concentration camp, and right outside of Auschwitz, there's a reminder that not only will you eventually get out of here, but you'll be able to build your lives again on the heap of ashes that you're experiencing today. So it's two messages that are equally important. Number one, this is not forever. There will be an end to this. But number two, you will be made whole. And not only whole, but you will be made as a leader, as a proud nation, as a powerful nation, as a tall nation. That's the secondary message that Yaakov Avinu wished to communicate to his children. And it was a message, we, we would dare say, that was the key to their survival and to their faith during those 400 or 200 years of avdus, of enslavement in Egypt. And the truth of the matter is, is that that's important for us in every generation. Because as much as we affirm that in every generation they rise up against us to destroy us, but we also have to have affirmations of the fact that we're only here temporarily, and that when we leave, we're going to be leaving as communius, as we're going to be leaving standing tall and erect and proud. And those, those reminders um, are all around us. Today, it's actually easier for us to be able to have those affirmations of our redemption because we already have, we already have the availability to travel to Eretz Israel whenever we need. But just imagine in prior generations. In prior generations, you didn't have a state of Israel, and it was necessary to create those reminders of the cedar trees in your backyard. And imagine the prayers that the Jewish people said in every generation, and the mitzvahs that they did in every generation to remind themselves of the fact that there will be a redemption. And every time when they would say, Es tzemach David avdecha mehirat atzmiach, that may God, may you sprout forth the scion of David, and bring us back to Jerusalem. Every single day, people were envisioning those cedar trees. Fortunately for us today, it's easier than ever to envision the cedar trees growing in our backyards. It's up to us to remember that the cedar trees are growing. We have to constantly remind ourselves that they're ripe for the harvest right now, and that all it takes for us is to chop down those trees prepare them to take them with us out into the desert of uncertainty and to be able to build our, our permanent and future homes in Eretz Yisrael. But that's what this imagery of Chazal is trying to portray for us, and I hope that we can take something of that with us as we move forward in our journey to getting back to Eretz Yisrael.